Hello and welcome to another Rygate Maths video. My name's Simon and today we are looking at the Forces and Motions chapter from the first year mechanics unit of the A-level mathematics. In this video we are focusing on looking at pulleys building on the idea of the previous video of Newton's third law or Newton's laws in general. If you haven't yet watched those videos, I would strongly advise you go back and do that as it will cover a lot of the key maths that you'll need to access these questions. Pulleys are very, very useful objects and have been in, in use for many, many years. You know, since ancient Egypt and the 12th, in the 12th dynasty, some 19, 1900 years BCE. Many ships nowadays still use pulleys, often known as blocks, and the purpose of a pulley is to be able to carry heavy objects while reducing the tension in a rope. Obviously that's really important for cargo ships, particularly before metal ropes were involved, using sort of hempen or fiber ropes, being able to lift heavy blocks of gold or spices onto a ship was really important. Rope in a time was very expensive and couldn't necessarily, they could, shipwrights couldn't afford to keep replacing rope. However, nowadays it's not so much of a problem, although having to pay attention to tensions in ropes is very use, is still very important for ships today, as a lot of the cargo has just got significantly heavier. We're not going to worry about that though. What we're going to be looking at is some examples of how pulleys work. In principle, these questions are going to work exactly the same as the connected particles questions from the previous video. The only difference, however, is that instead of both particles moving in the same direction and on the same surface, here we're going to have particles moving in two directions. So let's just look at this example first. We have two, two particles, masses 3 and 5 kilograms, connected by light in extensible string, hanging over a smooth fixed peg, shown in the diagram. So for the purposes of this, pulleys are far more complicated than what, how we're going to model them. Pulleys are lots of systems with lots of wheels. We just say, cool, it's a peg that we hang a rope over. That's what we do. Okay. So... The system is held at rest and then it is released. We want to find a bunch of information. So, as usual, first things first, let's label the diagram with all of the forces. So we've got this particle here, this three kilograms, which has a weight. Now we know the weight of this is going to be 3g, and the weight of this particle here is going to be 5g. On the string, there are going to be several tensions. But the only ones we need to worry about are these tensions here. The key thing is that these tensions are the same. Again, like before, it's down to the fact that the string is inextensible. It doesn't stretch. The tensions are the same, and also the accelerations are the same. Now, the key thing to think about is which direction are these things going to move? So we hold the masses and we let go. Which one moves down? Which one moves up? Well, clearly, the 5 kilogram mass is going to move down and the 3 kilogram mass is going to move up. And much like the tensions are the same, they accelerate at the same rate. Again, because the string does not stretch. So we want to find the acceleration of the particles. Now, with the previous video, the first step to work out maybe the driving force or the acceleration was that we could just consider the particles as one big chunk, one big thing. We can't do this this time because they are moving in different directions. So the first thing we have to do is separate the particles. Now, if you can do this without drawing boxes, that's great. 
But if you find you consistently get stuck on these questions, what I would advise doing is drawing a box around each and saying, OK, this is, part, this is one particle that I'm going to worry about, and here's a different one. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this particle on the left, the three kilogram particle. So because we're talking about acceleration and we have forces, we know we're going to be doing F equals MA. However, we need to think about what F is. F is the resultant force. On this particle here, we have two forces acting. We've got a tension and we've got a 3G. They are going in opposite directions and we need to decide which one is bigger. We know they're not the same because the masses are moving. They are accelerating. This one is accelerating up, so the upward force is bigger than the downward force. So we know that tension minus 3g is going to be 3a. Now I'm not going to work out 3g for now, and you'll see why, hopefully, in a moment. We can't do anything else with that. So we're going to move on and look at the other particle. Again, we're using F equals MA and we're using it in the same way. But now with this one, this particle is moving down. The 5G is bigger than the tension. Okay, this is equation one. This is equation 2. G we know is 9.8, but we'll come back to that. So these are two equations with two variables. We use simultaneous equations to find acceleration. We want to eliminate T, so we add these together. So we're going to get 5G minus 3G is 8A. So 2g is 8a, a is g over 4. And now, finally, I'm actually going to work that out. And we get 2.45 meters per second squared. Now, I like to give to three significant figures. However, to, writing your answer as 2.5 would also be valid in this case. Because we are only using g to Two, decimal, two significant figures, so to one decimal place, giving your answer to the same degree of accuracy is all that's required. I like to give three significant figures, though. Now, we've worked out acceleration first because that's what part A told us to do. If we wanted to, we absolutely could work out tension first and then acceleration. But for the purposes of this question, and these questions in general, typically... You're going to have t and t, and then some different multiples of a. So eliminating t first is generally easier, unless you're told to do the other way around. So part b, we are now finding the tension, which is a case of putting this back into one of our equations. So I'm just going to use equation 1. So we know that t minus 3g is going to be 3 times this 2.45. So T is going to be 3 times G plus 3 times 2.45, which is 7.35. Then we just stick it in the calculator and work it out. 3 times 9.8 plus our answer, 36, whoops, 36.75 newtons. So with part A and B, we're de we've dealt with the F equals MA stuff. Now let's look at part C. We want to know the distance travelled by each particle during the first two seconds of motion. Now each particle is going to move the same distance. Typically in the exam, they will cl make a clarification with this. And they will say something like, assuming that part the three kilogram particle does not hit the pulley, 
and the 5 kilogram particle does not hit the ground. Find, as we've been asked. Just to clarify. Now sometimes they'll do some crazy things like, oh, the particle, the 5 kilogram particle hits the ground. How far does the 3 part kilogram particle move before it stops? That kind of thing. But for now, we're going to keep it simple. So we want to just find the distance travelled by each particle during the first two seconds. So it's a SUVAC question. The particles are, which particle we use is irrelevant because they're both moving the same amount. We are trying to find distance. We know they both started at rest. We know the acceleration is 2.45 and we know the time is t. This is why the question asks for distance and not displacement. That's why it doesn't matter which particle we worry about, because they move the same distance in opposite directions. So that's why we're just going to worry about this being positive. But from there, we use the SUVAT equation that doesn't have V in. So S equals UT plus a half AT squared. And then we just stick all our variables in, or our constants. We know UT is going to go, so we had a half times 2.45 times 2 squared, which comes out as 4.9 meters. Obviously, S doesn't mean distance, so we should relate it back to the question. So we can say, therefore, each particle moves 4.9 meters in the first two seconds of motion. And now we're done. So essentially every pulley question works broadly in this way. Looking at each particle separately, doing F equals MA, and then simultaneous equations. Now, just because these two are both moving vertically doesn't mean that this is the way to do that and there's a different method for any other question. In example two that we're going to look at in a moment, you'll see what I mean. So we can see here we have a block of mass 13 kilograms on a rough horizontal table connected to a sphere of mass 7 kilograms by a string which passes over a smooth peg. System is released from rest and after 4 seconds the block and the sphere have both have a speed of 6 meters per second and the block has not reached the peg. So as usual before we even start the question let's start labeling some forces. So we know it's on a rough horizontal table which tells us immediately there's going to be a friction. This has a weight of 13 G and a reaction force R and then it has a tension pulling it along. Here the weight is 7 G, we've got a tension, again the tension is the same and the system is released from rest and moves. Okay. So it's going to accelerate in that direction. Because the string is going to pull it this way, this is not going to move backwards. Okay. Now I don't like this question particularly because the masses don't sort of line up with that. I feel they should be the other way around, but there we go. So part A, state two assumptions you should make about the string in order to model the motion of the sphere and the block. We've already done a couple of examples in this video and the previous one as to how we model the string. It's light and inextensible. You write that. So find the acceleration of the sphere. Okay, the acceleration of the sphere and the block are the same. Um, but we can't do the method we were looking at previously because we don't know the tension. We can't look at each separately because we don't know the friction. So we've got to do something else. In this case, we're doing kind of the, the example we just did backwards. We know some SUVAT material here, so we can use that to find acceleration. We can then use that to find tension, then use that to find friction. Might not always be working that way, but there we go. So for part B, we have our SUVAT. So we know it's 
has moved for four seconds, it started at rest, and it now has a speed of six, and we're trying to find the acceleration. We use the SUVAT equation that doesn't have S in. So we know it accelerates at a rate of 6 over 4. Oops. Sorry, that's, that's, a, that's an A, not a T. It accelerates at a rate of 6 over 4, which is 1.5 meters per second squared. Part C we're interested in the sphere. So the forces here are irrelevant and this is something students typically get wrong with this type of question. If you find you're starting to get confused, again, box each particle. I'm only going to worry about the sphere. Everything in the other box doesn't matter. Okay, this sphere is moving down. So we know F equals MA. So the six, the 7G force minus the tension is going to be mass times the acceleration. Okay, so we know that the T is going to be 7G minus 7 times 1.5, which is 10.5. Okay, and then we just work it out. So the tension is 58.1 Newtons. Now, if you want to, at this point, you can go back and edit your diagram, cross out the T's, but I tend not to. Okay, part D, find the friction between the block and the table. Now, we're done with this, we've got all the forces. The tensions are the same, the accelerations are the same. We can now repeat the process here in this box with F equals MA. So we know tension minus the friction is going to be equal to mass, 13, times the acceleration. So friction is going to be 58.1 minus 13 times 1.5, which comes out as 38 point six newtons. Okay. And we're done. We have found the friction between the block and the table. We have found the acceleration and we found the tension in the string. Again, next year when we do a lot more stuff with friction, we can do more things beyond here. Again, using something called the coefficient of friction, we can work out what that is, which is basically a, a measure of how slippy one, uh, one material is when in contact with another. It's like skates over ice have a very low coefficient of friction. Glue or like tires on tarmac have quite a high coefficient of friction. Because otherwise, if they don't, car doesn't move, which is why... Those of you who are learning to drive, it's why a slippery surface is harder to stop on, because there is a lower coefficient of friction. But that's something for next year. Otherwise, this has been friction uh, forces of motion using pulleys. And again, just to reiterate with this example particularly, because the error that students tend to make with this part C is go, okay, this T and this 7G are going up and down. I have some up and down forces up here as well. Okay, I've got an R and a 13G. So I'm gonna consider those as well as here. You don't. This is in a box on its own. You just worry about these forces.
Thank you for watching.